Hi, I'm Michelle Segrist, and welcome to the Factory of the Future podcast, an in-depth look at the people, processes, and innovations that are changing the landscape of modern manufacturing. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and leave me a five-star rating on iTunes and take just a couple of seconds to leave a review. And then go ahead and hit that subscribe button right now so you don't miss a single episode. I am so excited today about this episode. As you may know, I have toured nearly 100 manufacturing facilities in 12 countries on three continents. Every facility is different and unusual. Factories don't have to be huge, ominous, gray buildings blowing smokestacks into the sky like what we think of when we think of a a factory. In fact, those kinds of factories are becoming few and far between. I've personally seen a few wild and unusual factories through the years. I've waded through the waste, literally the waste, of a million Parisians in the sewers of Paris, and I've been in factories that were fully operated with robotics and only just a few people sitting in a control room that looks something like a cockpit of a spaceship. I've also written about a facility located almost 14,000 feet above sea level at the summit of a dormant volcano in Hawaii. So I put all the links to these articles in the show notes, but today we're going to hear about some of the amazing and unusual and crazy factories that my guest, Daniel Lokovich, has seen. Daniel is a longtime friend and industry colleague, and we have collaborated through the years on many interesting projects. Daniel is currently the Business Development Manager at Flotweg Separation Technologies, and he's going to tell us about some wild and crazy installations. But first, I want to tell you a little about Flotweg. As the world population increases, drinking water becomes something extremely vital for more and more people. This means that the treatment and purification of wastewater is becoming increasingly paramount. One of the key technologies in this field comes from Floatvague. Our team's motivation comes from an awareness that it is they who keep our modern lives in motion through their work. Be this through efficient solutions for oil recovery, plastics recycling, or the production of biofuels. This is why every single one of us gives everything we have every day to always achieve the best possible result. When in contact with customers all over the world and when sharing ideas for solutions with colleagues, such personal bonds, along with a sincere sense of responsibility, make the work here something very special. Continual learning is as much an integral part of our corporate culture as is our genuine interest for understanding the individual needs of different industries. This philosophy has positioned Floatveg among the top producers of decanters, separators, and belt presses for more than 60 years. These separation solutions provide Floatveg's partners with a decisive competitive advantage. This is reflected in higher economic efficiency, maximum performance, outstanding process safety with unwavering reliability, or simply in a glass of clean drinking water. Floatvake, engineered for your success. It is my pleasure to welcome Daniel to the show. Hi, Michelle. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course, it's great to to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. And as you know, this is one of my favorite topics, so I'm really excited to talk to you about this. But first, tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself and your background and your industry experience so that they have an idea of who you are and why you're an expert. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I've been in industrial machine equipment for over 10 years at this point. Started my career with a pump manufacturer worked for a B2B marketing agency for a while where I represented all types of different machining clients to help them promote their products and help them tell their stories. Most recently, I moved to Flotweg a few years ago and am now all about centrifuges and separation equipment. That's been exciting. It's a different type of machine, but again, it just baffles me the different types of places these machines are used. 
I tell people a lot that my job is, it feels a lot like that show, How It's Made, because yeah. the visits that we do, as you know, you get in there and you, I had no idea that this is how it's done. And so that's super exciting part of the job. My role right now with Flotweg is basically to promote the equipment and tell stories about centrifuges for uh, North and South America. It's pretty cool. And through working with you, I have learned a lot about centrifuges myself. And just for those people out there that may be listening who don't know what a centrifuge is, can you just give an elementary description of what that is and what it does? Sure. In the most basic sense, a centrifuge is a machine that spins really, really fast and separates liquids from solids. The best visual reference I can make is imagine your washer on the spin cycle. It's a drum that spins really fast. Basically, the solids stick to the exterior of the spinning bowl and get pushed out with an auger. And then the liquid flows uh, to the opposite end and is either flows out by gravity or is pumped away. Well, it's pretty cool machinery. And you and I have been in some cool places. And you've been in even more than I have. But I've seen some of the Flotweg equipment in action. And I know we're going to talk about some of those applications today. But first, I want you to talk about one of the installations that is that I, is kind of near and dear to my heart because I studied it and talked to the people there. But this is the one that's on the fishing vessel Starbound. Tell us about this. It's really cool. The Starbound is a fishing vessel. It's ported out of Seattle. They fish for Pollock. What they did is they essentially cut the entire boat in half because they were just they were just catching and processing the fish. But they wanted to also add in uh, fish meal and fish oil processing. And so they cut the entire boat in half and added an additional processing plant into the boat. And so now when they're out at sea, they're catching pollock and they're bringing on board and they're processing into fillets and mints and surimi. But they're also processing some of the mints into a little further into fish meal Oil and water, those are the three parts that they separate, and they're using a tricanter for that. So that actually separates into three separate materials, which is solids, oil, and water. So that's super interesting to me because when they show back up to port, they're not unloading fish products. They're unloading boxes that are basically ice and that are ready to ship to whomever is going to be you know, using that or consuming that. Yeah, this is so interesting because just just in case the listeners miss this, okay, this is a facility that is processing seafood on board the ship. And so they go out to sea and they catch the fish and then they have a whole manufacturing facility on board. They process it and, as you said, package it. And so when they get back to shore, it's ready to ship to the grocery stores and the customers. It's yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And this is also, it, it's like a over a thousand tons, this ship. It's a huge ship. It's over 300 feet long. Cut it in half. It's just so cool. Yeah. You actually saw it, didn't you? Yeah, I was actually there. I was on, been on board the ship and got the tour. So it's quite amazing. Several different levels too. It was, it was pretty wild. They were just doing work uh, in port when I was there to get it ready for the next run. That's another interesting point because they only have a few months while they're at port to make any adjustments to the ship because they want it out catching fish to make the money. And so when they're in port, they are on a super tight schedule to make sure that all the contractors that they need, all the equipment that they need is there and is ready to be put on board in a very tight schedule so they can get back out and get back to work. I was really grateful that they actually took some time for me to be able to tour it and get a video. Their time is so tight. Yeah, we'll definitely put that link to that video in the show notes so that people can access it really easily and really quickly. When you were on board, did it feel like you were on a ship or did it feel like you were just in a factory on land somewhere? Well, when you're walking through the, let's just say the guts of the ship, it definitely just looks like a processing plant. But I will say you do get the reminder that you're on a ship because everything is put together so tightly. You can imagine that space on a ship is at a premium. They are absolutely looking to optimize their space to the fullest. You're walking over equipment 
and you're having to duck down in a lot of places to get through tight corners to get to wherever you're going. Yeah. So this definitely is one of those facilities where it wouldn't feel like a gen- like you're in a warehouse type building, uh, you know, out in the, you know, just on flat land. I mean, also the ship, I guess, is moving. Can you feel the movement of the ship? Well, at port, we really didn't have uh, any movement. Uh, it, you know, it's docked. There's not a whole lot of waves, but I'm certain that when this thing is out at sea and going through some big swells, that you're going to feel quite a bit of movement. Uh, uh, I've been on many ships at sea, maybe not any that big, but I can assure you they feel something out there. And so they're having to run this processing plant in motion, really. And and sometimes in a storm and sometimes with heavy, as you said, waves and swells. That's yeah. just fascinating. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think that you told me once that you have some, that Flotweg has a few other ship installations. Well, so this kind of transitions well into a different story. We have more tricanters doing similar processing, but it's on an island called Accutan. So this is part of the Aleutian Islands. It's off of Dutch Harbor in Alaska. If you can imagine, like in between Alaska and Russia, it's out there. You know, you could describe it as literally the end of the world. <laughs> wow! Uh, and even the the travel process to get there, it's probably a twenty four hour trip. But you fly out to Seattle. From Seattle, you fly to Anchorage. Anchorage, Dutch Harbor, and then from Dutch Harbor, you take this sea plane that's called the Goose. It's the only plane that flies there. And then when you land at Accutan, it's, that's it. That's all there is. There's very few people there. The locals like to call it Accutraz <laughs> in a way because like the person Alcatraz because it's just, it's very hard to get to and even harder to get off. So <laughs> some of the folks that we've sent out there, they got stuck for days because they, the goose couldn't fly. The goose only flies when there's decent weather. And as you can imagine, in that part of the world, That doesn't happen that often. Some of our folks almost got stranded and had to take a fishing trawler back to Dutch Harbor through, you know, all kinds of crazy seas so that we can get back home. And that was after having already spent three days on Accutan. That's an interesting application just because of its remoteness. So they're doing similar things like they are doing on the Starbound, again, with a tricanter separating solids, oils, and water. Well, I'm sure that tricanter, I've seen them, they're huge. That that would probably not fit on the goose. Do, do they get the equipment there by boat yeah. or, okay, that makes more sense. And do the people who work at the facility actually live on that island? Yeah, so they live there for a time. It's kind of seasonal. You can imagine they go out there and they'll work for a couple months and then come back and spend time with family. It's for a a certain amount of time and then they come back and then they go back out. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Uh, Is the island, I've never heard of it, but that, of course, there's a lot of places in the world I've never heard of. I wonder why. Why is it there? Yeah, I can only imagine that it's uh, the closeness to the to the fishing grounds. As I don't, I'm not sure if that's why you call it, but you know, that's where the fish fish are. Yeah, so um, it probably makes more sense for them to be close to the fish, and as you said earlier, do more processing and wasting less time, so they can get back out there and catch more fish. I mean, that's yeah, the name of the game, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, it's probably easier to get to Accutan and process it there and then ship it back than to bring the non-processed fish back to say Dutch Harbor and then go back out and fish. I mean, I can imagine, I mean, this fish, you know, fish goes bad quickly. So maybe this is why there's this need to go ahead and process it. Can't let it sit on ice too long. Maybe. I don't know. Is that true? As far as I know, they have live wells on board. And so some of the you know, bigger fishing boats, they will keep them on board. I think crab boats are similar. They have a live well, but those animals can only survive so long in those. They need to be processed fairly quickly. Right. Well, that is just absolutely fascinating. I have to try to make a trip to that particular installation sometime. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so- the Ticanter is a perfect machine for that application because it's separating those three phases all in one machine. 
Well, tell our listeners why it's important. Why is it important to separate the fish and the oil? Trichendra can be used for multiple applications. It's also used in some areas where there's waste, any kind of oily, watery, solid mixture. That can happen in mining and in some other uh, applications and in some waste applications too. But essentially, the machine is separating those three phases all in one machine. And so historically, what you would have done, you would have used two separate machines to do this process. You would use a decanter, which is a two-phase separator, to separate liquids and solids. But then now you have an oily, watery phase, which you need to run through a separate machine, which they would usually use a, a disk stack separator. That machine is it spins at a much higher speed. It has a similar technology. Its, sh- its shape is a little different, but it does the same thing. It's just for more fluid materials. So that then separates the oil and the water. So now you have the three phases, but you use two machines. You do all of these things in one machine. The tricanter can do the steps that would have taken two machines in one machine. Ah. That's the big innovation with the tricanter. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. I have seen this technology in action when you and I went to one of the beer processing facilities. It was very cool because you saw how it separated the different materials, like the what was it, the hops and the, so, the barley and stuff that separated out and made a clear... Yeah. Explain how that worked. So anything that is in your fermentation tanks. Nowadays, folks are putting all kinds of different materials into their beer, and that's awesome. It does create some extra challenges, too. You know, you have your beer fermenting in a fermentation tank, and after that, you're going to transfer it to, I believe they're called green green tanks or green beer tanks. You have to pull the materials out that you put in the mixture to ferment the beer so that's your yeast your hops can be sometimes it's chocolate or peanut butter or whatever else you you know if you dry hopped it all that material is going to settle to the bottom of the tank in the past most or what most breweries will do is they will let a lot of thick material it's almost like a syrupy kind of think of imagine it's like a smooth a thicker smoothie or syrupy kind of mixture and they let that drain out until it's almost a very uh, it's a very fluid type of material so maybe like a thicker apple juice t- type you could imagine and then that is pumped to a distack separator and then the separator spins at a very high speed and removes any of those additional solids now if you're making like a wheat beer You want those solids. So you're probably not even going to run it through a machine. You might just go straight into carbonation and then bottling after that. But if you're wanting like a Pilsner or a light beer that doesn't have any particulates, you're going to need to run it through a centrifuge. That's the application that you saw for the separators. Now, what we're also doing for breweries, that material that would have just gone down the drain previously, we're able to run that through a decanter now and recover the rest of the beer that would have essentially been dumped down the drain before a lot of the like mid-sized breweries that are dumping enough material down to justify the purchase of a decanter are now doing that and we're really getting some traction and some breweries doing that as well on the solid side they're also able to sell that material now because those spent grains that can be feed for animals and uh-huh. so now, not only are you recovering beer, but anything that would have been solid is also dumped down the drain. They can also sell that now. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. cool because that brings in this recycling element to the process. So they're yeah. much less waste and then everything is used for something, right? That's right. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's another feel good for me when we're able to hook some of our customers up with some machinery that is now turning a waste stream in, in essentially you have one waste stream, but if you just separate that waste stream into two separate phases, you can use, sell both. And so it, it turns an expense a lot of times into a profit. That's fantastic. That's, that's really cool. Are there any other cool facilities you want to tell me so about? So a good segue for if we're talking about fermentation is that we're doing in in pharmaceuticals for creating omega-3 type fatty acids. You can do that as well, but you're using a yeast in a fermentation broth that's trained to do something different, right? There are some customers that are doing that. They're creating a fermentation broth that's similar to beer 
but they're separating out liquids and solids, and then they might be keeping the solid side versus where in beer, you're interested in the liquid side. So that's for using some supplements, and that's used for, yeah, like I said, so, some fatty acids. Um, there's another customer that's doing it for a glucosamine supplement joint. Um, oh, yeah. uh, for a supplement that's used for joint health. Yeah, yeah I take it for I, my needs. I have I tennis it, needs. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a boxer and I give her glucosamine. And so I was, I was super interested in that to, to learn that we're, we're using that or we're supplying machines to customers that are using it for that. And that application is interested, interesting because they're using ground up chicken bones and then yeah. adding some uh, liquid. And then once it's this like, kind of you know it's kind of doesn't sound very attractive but this <laughs> soupy uh, ground of chicken bone mix and then they're separating out separating out those materials and that essentially is what becomes your uh, glucosamine supplement that is pretty cool <laughs> yeah I was talking to you once about at, at a uh, meat processing plant yep. where some of your equipment some of the flatwig equipment was there and they, they separated it all out and then some of it was used for meat for people to eat and then some of it was used for like fertilizer for crops and other parts were used to create dog food and right. animal food and it was just so cool that really nothing went to waste yeah and that's where we really need to be to be able to sustain our growth on this planet we have to use everything that that it has been given to us if we can help with that that's absolutely amazing uh, that's definitely a feel good Yes, I agree completely. I mean, it was hard for me to see the little piggies going in, but to know yeah. that all everything was, but of course I love to eat ham and bacon and everything, yeah. so I can't say too much. Yeah. But uh, but at the same time, it's nice to know that every single part is being used yeah. for something productive. But, you know, even on for the uh, plant eaters and vegans or vegetarians out there, that's happening as well. The meat substitutes, that's something that's also going to need processing of plants and s separation. We have uh, quite a bit of installations in wheat starch in, in Europe and also for oat milk. When your oat milk is interesting, so you grind up the oats and you may basically make a flour and mix it with water. And then you're running it through a, a centrifuge to remove the solids and you're left with oat milk. That's pretty cool as well, you know, and that's, that's happening for peas and beans. They're extracting proteins and all other types of materials that are within these plants. It's so interesting. And it kind of goes back to what you said earlier about how it's just fascinating to learn how things are made. And, you know, like you wonder, how do they make oatmeal, oat milk or whatever? How do they make almond milk? I've always thought about that, too. A lot of that has to do with separation. Yeah, they're squeezing that almond really, really hard to get the milk. Yeah, out. exactly. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that we talk about a lot on this podcast is Industry 4.0 and kind of the future of manufacturing. And I know that your equipment has a lot of really cool gadgets and instrumentation attached to it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? and? kind of the evolution of that because we want to talk about industry 4.0 and how things are moving forward in manufacturing. Yeah, absolutely. Industry 4.0, some others call it uh, the internet of things or machinery being connected and smart and telling us what to do with them. And that's definitely the next step. Some of the things that Flotwick does with their centrifuges, we have devices that are essentially listening to its health. We have vibration sensors that can detect variations from the set boundary limits, and that can also that can be a, a maintenance predictor. It can help a operations manager or maintenance manager schedule ahead of time when the machine is going to need some service. So that you don't run into a situation where you have a, a catastrophic failure and then you're down for or you're scrambling to get your machinery fixed. And, you know, you can reference it to like doing an oil change in your car. Right. You sure that it's maintained well. So it's always going to be reliable and producing for you. 
Yeah, predictive maintenance continues to be a trend in manufacturing. And in fact, I probably wouldn't even call it a trend anymore. It's a necessity. It's something that we talk about every single year when we talk about what's happening this year. Predictive mm-hmm. maintenance is always a part of it. And talk to some of your some of the operators of the Flotwig equipment in some of these facilities. And you probably have some more videos you could if you'll um we'll put some of those in the links to those in the show notes as well, of these operators talking about how this kind of technology that's attached to these machines has really made their job so much easier. Yeah, and in any way that we can help them to make sure that they have peace of mind, you know, I call it like the uh, weekend barbecue uh, safety net. (laughs) So (laughs) the the guy isn't uh, getting messages on his phone that's going to pull him away from his family and have him rush to his facility because something's wrong. That peace of mind, I think, is of a nice value. We have some machinery as these devices that can be connected to a centrifuge and we can actually remote connect to them. And so our engineers can look at what's happening within the process and make some adjustments to optimize what's going on. So that can that can actually happen as well. Yeah. And it's just another chapter in this evolution of manufacturing that we talk about all the time. I I know that a lot of these guys that I talk to in facilities, they talk about the old days where they would have to sit and babysit the machines on uh, shifts, like uh, like you said, over the weekend while their families were at barbecues, they had to sit there in the facility and uh, literally have their hand on the machine to make sure there was no vibration. And now they could sit at the barbecue, as you said, and have a notification come up on their cell phone even to say, hey, okay, now there's a problem that you need to go check on. But otherwise they can sit and relax and enjoy the barbecue. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I've seen some CEOs or operations directors on their cell phone be able to pull up programs where he, where he has complete control over the entire plant on his phone. And he can just pumps and, you know, reroute valving and shut down machines, control the lights, the air. It's pretty amazing how far it's come. It's fascinating. Do you think that these companies are effectively preparing for what the future of manufacturing looks like? I do think so. There's so much hype out there. There's a lot of equipment that can be used. It's deciding what you want to use that makes sense. If you have unlimited budgets, yes, you could automate your entire plant, put robotics in for everything. That's possible. But most companies still have to keep an eye on on finances. So what is feasible at this moment? There's a trade-off, right? Automation is great. But you have to keep in, uh, in mind that some things do require human touch still. Uh, yes. Let's talk about spirits or beer manufacturing. That requires a craftsman. Although machines can do a lot, you still have to have an eye on those things to make sure that you're producing the right thing or right material, right end product. Yeah, that's a perfect analogy when you talk about a craftsman. And and I do think a lot of these operators, whether they're in the food and beverage field or something different, they consider themselves craftsmen. They are producing a special product that has to be manufactured in a certain way. I don't think we're ever going to lose that human touch. I hope not. I hope that's not replaced by robots. Yeah. And you know, the, the old school way, and I've heard, I heard this since I started in industrial machining, you'd have the guy that's in the plant, he's been there 20, 30 years, and he can walk by a piece of equipment and just put his hand on it and know if it's okay or not. That's right. They can smell it. They can hear it. They can use all their senses. You're augmenting that and you're making that transition to so when he's teaching the next generation, uh, he can make them better or make that transition quicker. So as they're learning, they have that technology as a crutch to make sure that, okay, am I smelling that? Uh, Let me check my tablet. Yeah. Okay. There's something up here. I think that is going to help in teaching as well. So you, do you think they're using some of this high-end technology to sort of supplement or complement what they see and hear and feel with their senses? I absolutely think that's the case. To work on some of these pieces of equipment can take a lot of time and that costs money. If you can tell for certainty that something is up before you get into that, that can really be a big savior. The last thing you want to do is open up the equipment and spend a day down and then turns out, It was the AC unit that's above the machine that was making that noise. Knowing exactly what you need to work on, when you need to work on it, is certainly valuable to these folks. Yeah, I would certainly think so. 
This is such a fun and interesting conversation. We could probably talk about this for hours and hours, but I just, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and I'm sure we have a lot more to talk about. So hopefully you'll come back and we can do another one. But for now, I just, I want to give you the last word. Is there anything else that you can tell us about how factories are becoming more interesting and innovative? It's the various locations and what is being done around the world to make materials that's so interesting to me. Like you said, we could spend a ton more time on this, but just to mention a couple, we have mining applications in Russia and South America, some which are above 4,000 meters. We're processing gold and silver and diamonds. We're processing oil waste off of shores to remediate oil spills, or we're processing all kinds of different crazy cool materials to produce things for people around the world. And that's to feel good for me to know that we can help folks. I always say I'm in marketing. Really, my goal is to educate and teach somebody. And if I can do that, then I think I did my job. Well, you're very good at it. And I've certainly learned a lot during this conversation. And I know there's a lot more to learn. I just want to, again, thank you for being here. It's been fun. And I want to remind our listeners that Daniel and Flotweg Separation Technologies can help your company compete on the global market with innovative separation technologies that will accelerate your manufacturing processes considerably. In addition to the machine, the efficiency of the tire process plays an important role in achieving the best results. With the right engineering and the right solutions, you will get the most out of your process. Flotweg takes over the engineering for you. From project planning to the planning of complete process solutions to strategically engineering a reliable and efficient operating process. On the hunt for maximum separation efficiency, Flotweg engineers and technicians continually and radically question its existing centrifuge concept. They are inspired by the lightweight construction of high-performance sports cars and motorcycles, and they came up with the idea of a novel centrifuge design. The heart of the new design, the rotor and decanter scroll, were redesigned from the ground up. The new Exelator system is therefore an entirely new stage of evolution for centrifugal sludge dewatering in sewage treatment plants. The result is a roll cage inspired scroll body. And because the Exelator decanter lacks a scroll body, in feed efficiency is reduced and throughput is increased. You save on wear parts and lower maintenance costs. Thanks to Flotweg's highly effective wear protection on material contact parts, wear is reduced and abrasion is kept to a minimum. The result is a long service life and lower maintenance costs. Exelator decanter centrifuges bring sludge dewatering to a new level. For more information, you can go to flotweg.com right now and I'll put a link in the show notes. What kind of applications is the, is the Exelator being used in, Daniel? Exelator is currently being used for wastewater treatment plants to separate sludge or biosolids for dewatering. But there are moves to actually implement it in some other applications as well. So that is a story that should be coming out here pretty soon. We're pretty excited about it. There are definitely other ways to apply it, mostly wastewater right now, but others are on the, on the way. This brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on iTunes. If you have interesting information to share and want to contact me about being a guest on a future episode of this podcast, please send me an email at michelle at navigatecontent.com. You can also send me questions that I will have my expert guests answer for you on a future episode. And in the meantime, please check out my book series on modern manufacturing to read more than 30 real-world case studies about how global companies are using smart technology and innovation to build the factory of the future. All the links to the books and articles mentioned in this podcast are in the show notes. Have a great week and please join me for the next episode of Factory of the Future. Mm -hmm.